Hey, everybody, and welcome back to No Earthly Explanation. This is the podcast where we dive into the things that are just unexplainable. If you're new to listening, I am your scientific host, Ellie Ringo of Ellie Knows Rocks, and with me is the ever-brilliant investigative host, Don Schmidt. How are you doing, Don? Good evening. I am doing fine. How are you doing? (laughs) I'm doing okay. (laughs) It's been a long day. we, we have to always be careful when these programs actually air as to when we talk of the season, but uh, we're recording this just as we enter now the Christmas season. Yes. But nonetheless, uh, things are still in the news. Washington is still looking into uh, subject matter that um, interests both of us. Mm-hmm. In that uh, there seems to be an internal feud going as to whether they're going to have further discussions as far as further committee meetings on the subject of UAPs, UFOs. And wow. I'm sure we'll be covering that in the next uh, few episodes. Uh, but tonight I'm really looking forward to something that impacts, affects all of us Me in too. one aspect or another. And I'm always, I've always been led to believe that the healthier you are, the healthier your dreams that you have as far as good rapid eye movement states, as opposed to those who, you know, basically just nap through in evenings and nighttime sleep and that they can have all types of mental, you know, uh, you know, ailments that actually develop as a result. So why don't you go ahead and introduce our guest. Well, but I totally agree with you, Don, about the dreams. I'm I'm obsessed with knowing that. I started writing mine down a long time ago. But our guest this evening or afternoon or whenever you are listening is that Daniel was, Oldis. That was a horror <laughs> novel, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. A horror novel. But uh, okay. Daniel, actually, Daniel Oldis is our guest this evening. Um, let's welcome him in. How are you doing, Daniel? Well, hello, and uh, thanks for having me on. I'm uh, looking forward to it. Oh, Same here, Daniel. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the the things that I've been looking into you about what you do and stuff with dreams and trying to map dreams and study dreams, it's fascinating to me. I've always been a very vivid dreamer. I can wake up in the morning and taste and smell and still hear the things that happened in my dream, which freaks me out. But I really wanted to learn more about my dreams so early on I started writing down everything from drawing out really vivid pictures to the things that I could that I thought I could feel or colors or just landscapes and stuff like that and I I've always loved remembering my dreams so I'm one of those people who can actually get up in the middle of the night go get a glass of water come back and go back into my dream so um without, without talking about that stuff but Hi, my first question to you, like, how in the world or why did you start doing this, like, in a nutshell? Because I'm just fascinated. Well, I was uh, just a little kid, actually, when I started really getting interested in dreams. And uh, I started having lucid dreams, which are dreams where you know you're dreaming. And some kind of times you can control your dream. And so I'd be, I think I was like in fifth grade or something in the middle of the night, I'd have a dream and and I realized I was dreaming. So I'd go to school in the dream. All the kids were there, the teachers, and I'd walk in and say, everybody, this is my dream. You all are just people in my dream. And I'd jump in the air and fly around the room a little bit. And I'd say, I could, you know, make you all vanish if I want. So everybody better be pretty nice to me because you're all in my own world, right? And so... (laughs) Ever, ever since then, I uh, uh, was interested in dreams, and then in, uh, in college, I got more interested in uh, research and experiments with dreams and experiments with uh, with lucid dreams, and tried to different methods of inducing lucid dreams, and uh, and from there, and then I just sort of. Uh, Backed off a little bit from dreams for quite a few years. I was busy with different kind of uh, different kind of jobs and different kind of work, and I was. Yeah, you were a teacher. I was a teacher, yes, for a long time at, back in the Midwest at uh, University of South Dakota and a couple of community colleges, and and then I got work. I got involved with uh, 
IT stuff and did that for a while. And then I suppose it was about, uh, oh, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago, I, I got interested pretty heavy in dreams again. And uh, partly because uh, an old uh, book or paper I had written in the 70s actually had been uh, reissued and I got a lot of uh, attention and stuff. So it got me interested again. I thought maybe I wasn't so old as I thought. So, uh, and I became interested in um, one aspect of dreams. Now this is just, it's it's science, it's engineering. It's, so it's not para, paranormal. A research scientist, right. Yes. right. So I became interested in, the question is, could a person communicate from within their dream to another person within their dream? So if I'm dreaming and I'm walking through the woods, can like I- Like Inception. Yeah, like Inception. Uh, but we're not sharing the same dream. I'm actually walking in my dream. Uh -huh. And can I somehow just say hello to somebody else in their dream where they're on a, on a ship, say? Okay. Just like a simple communication. Mm -hmm. And so I started working with a, a group of uh, students and stuff at Arizona State and uh, and a, a guy at Cornell and to try to set up the technology where a person could send a very simple signal from one dream to another. And uh, we were able to do that and, you know, we presented it at a conference and everything. So that got me more and more interested in dreams. And I was always still interested in lucid dreams because that's part of dream to dream communication. Uh, and then after that, I got really interested in, wouldn't it be really cool if we could record our dreams? Like YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I got started on this when I was reading an, uh, a journal article by a group in Japan that were first able to actually record visual images in the brain from memories. So basically, if you remember like a house that you lived in, they could reproduce that on a computer. They could record what you were imagining in your mind, right? Your visual imagery in your mind. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, if they could do that when they're awake, you could do that when you're dreaming, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so right, right. I started writing about capturing visual imagery from dreams and working with um, a couple of universities. And then because dreams are not just visual, they're also conversations, right? We talk in dreams. Other dream characters talk to us. Oh. So I got involved with recording right. and reconstructing verbal behavior speech in dreams mm -hmm. and body movement in dreams. Because when you're in dreams, you're moving around, you're walking, you're mm -hmm. talking, some people fly or run, you wave to people, whatever, just like we do in waking life. And this can be recorded with certain type of uh, technology called electromyography, mm -hmm. which really just sensors on the muscles of the body. Which is an EMG, in other words, it, 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 it's a testing as far as the, the nerve, uh, response to the uh, muscles exactly exactly emg correct and so in a dream right. when when we walk or raise our arm or whatever we do even though we don't physically do it we're sleeping in our bed right mm -hmm. unless we're sleepwalking but otherwise we're sleeping pretty much most of us but the impulses from the from the brain are still going to all those muscles very weak, weakly you know diminished but still could be recorded with uh emg sensors and the same mm -hmm. is true of speech muscles. You can put the EMG sensors around the muscles involved with speech. Around the vocal cords, yeah. And reconstruct dream speech. Oh. What people are saying in the dream. Mm -hmm. And also, surprisingly, what the other characters are saying to you. Because another character in dreams actually is part of you, right? It's part of your coming from your own brain. It's part yeah. of your own personality, as, as Jung would say. And when the other character speaks, they sort of appropriate your speech muscles, your physical speech muscles in your body. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you could record the both conversations. Now, the actual proof of this has been on a very uh, minimal level. It, it's been shown in, in a, a group in Russia that has a sleep lab recently has shown capture certain phrases in dreams, you know, and certain words and stuff spoken in dreams. So it's it's just on the early stages, but it's already been done to capture dream imagery, visual imagery. I was involved with capturing body movement 
walking in dreams, running in dreams, whatever, mm-hmm. and reproducing that in uh, Avatar on a visual, mm-hmm. uh, virtual Avatar. Mm-hmm. And then recently groups have been able to capture and reconstruct speech in dreams. So you have the three main aspects of dreams, the mm-hmm. visual, the body movement, and the verbal. The, all of these have had a proof of concept. It's a, it'd be a long time before we could actually upload our YouTube into YouTube, our dreams. <laughs> Massive uh, amounts of AI, AI, right? Good point. AI is starting to come into play. Yeah. To help, to help do this, you know, to help interpret the dream and reconstruct the dream. Yeah. And are yeah. they using that to, I mean, like currently to, you know, kind of fill in the blanks that are being mapped out is that something of where that's going to go to or well i think uh i think that's a good point uh they've started to use it especially with the visual imagery mapping in dreams right and Mm -hmm. then ai can come into play like you say to fill in some of the holes Mm -hmm. like if i'm walking down the street and i'm ringing a doorbell I don't dream of walking up the steps, so I just jump uh-uh. from right walking to the doorbell. AI can fill in that I must have walked up the steps, right, to get there. Yes. You know, it can fill in holes in the story. Uh-huh. That is starting to, and this technology is all coming together. But, you know, a big problem for dream research is the funding. Uh, yeah. the, the money doesn't go into dream research like it does outer space, you know, Mars. Well, it's not very well known. <laughs> We don't see any commercials on television soliciting <laughs> dream funding. No, no. Right, right. Very true. But it just, um, yeah. I wanted to ask, uh, you, you, you mentioned that even through college, you were part of some of the dream research. Was it always as an observer or were you even a participant at times? Yes. Well, I was, I was a participant. Back then, uh, we didn't have much high tech. So we would uh, try to induce lucid dreams, get people to know they're dreaming, right? How did you first induce them into uh, like a lucid dream? What was the first breakthrough there? There's many, you know, like out on the web, there's many techniques to sort of learn how to lucid dream by training your uh, behavior, what they call reality checks and, you know, different things. But I was interested in the principle of dreams called uh, sensory incorporation. Mm Mm-hmm. And you probably notice, like if you're dreaming and and maybe a, a a fire truck is going by your house, it comes into your dream, like maybe, but it 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 comes in as part of the story. Yeah. So like maybe the school bell's ringing, you know, or your phone is ringing in your dream. So it incorporates the outside uh, stimulus, mm-hmm. but it makes it part of the story. So the idea, uh, and actually today, you know, many many years later, you can buy sleep masks that will signal you when you're in a dream. And what they do, they use like auditory cues. Your, um, yeah, right, they detect your eye movements. And then they like- Yeah, eye movement. Right, eye movement, rapid eye movement. And then when they know you're dreaming, they uh, like flash a red light in the mask. And then this comes into your dream, like maybe the sun, you're walking along the street and the sun is flashing. And then you go, oh, that's right, that's a reminder, I'm dreaming. It's like a, it's like a cue. Right, it's like a cue that you're dreaming, or you could oh, yeah. be dreaming you're in a movie theater, right? And uh, the exit red exit light is flashing on and off, or a traffic sign, but it reminds you that you're dreaming. So today you can buy these types of masks. But back then we didn't have that tech, so we course, tried we tried tactile stimulation. For example, we'd have these old wind old time wind up alarm clocks. Mm-hmm. And you just sort of muffle, muffle the bell on it. And we taped it to our hands, set the alarm clock for about like seven and a half hours. It'd be like a half hour before you normally wake up because we normally dream most in the morning. Mm-hmm. And when the alarm clock would go, would go off, it would just sort of vibrate your hand. And this would come into the dream, like somebody shaking your hand or somebody grabbing you or something. And it reminded us that, oh, I'm dreaming, right? I better have a lucid dream. So I did that on myself too. So I was a, a subject of these experiments uh, sometimes as well, just as a observer or researcher. And as we know, so often these were conducted as far as voluntarily by students within, uh, you know, as far as on college campuses and mainly due to lack of funding. Were you also, was there also research as to, to the contrary? Uh, 
the uh, sleep deprivation that when you would prevent people from going into REM for extended periods yeah. of time and the mental uh, you know, effects that it would have on the participants. Uh, well, I haven't tried that myself, but uh, th you know, they've done many uh, experiments on sleep deprivation and the effects. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, some of the effects of memory, uh, memory loss during the day, uh, mm -hmm. confusion, you know, stuff like that. Halluc even hallucinating. At, after, a certain... after a while, you will start dreaming whether you're awake or not. <laughs> right. right. And actually, with sleep deprivation, uh, like in mice and stuff like that, if you go too long, like it is like five days, uh, the poor animal just dies. If you're not allowed to sleep, you will eventually die. Yeah. Now, they don't know. And that's significant because, I mean, I've heard scientists say that's where we all very peacefully our brains go crazy each night, that all of our demons uh, have a free reign as far as strictly within our subconscious. And we wake up refreshed in the morning because we had a good solid night of, you know, deep sleep, deep uh, as far as dream, lucid dream state. Would that be your, uh, you know, observation, your assessment of, uh, you know, the healthier one's dream state, the healthier they are, both physically and mentally? Well, there does seem to be a relationship. You know, unfortunately, there's no worldwide consensus on the function of dreaming, uh, why we dream. There's many theories on why we dream. One of them could be, like you said, it, it creates sort of a freeze up your brain to make all these associations, unusual association, and in a sense, mm -hmm. it's a form of practice for the brain is not confined to just waking reality. It lets itself go, be creative, right? And the brain is doing all these wild associations right, right. and creativity, and that somehow we need that. And if we don't have that, uh, we're affected. Our health is affected. It's part of our mental health. And so that is one theory. And the other main theory of dreams, it's just a form of consolidating long-term memories. It actually is part of the uh, in evolutionary adaptation this was a way that memories acquired during the day were stored in long-term memory and yeah. reinforced so it's part of the brain uh, uh, physiology continuing on that thought i don't mean to I, I don't want to cut you off ellie but i want you to jump right in but uh, i'm surprised that given this is something that mankind humankind has experienced you know as long as it's existed that that we're still dealing with theories that we probably know more about space than we do about dream state. Am I correct in even you know making such a statement? No, I think you are correct. And actually, you're right. We know more about outer space than we know about inner space. <laughs> and wow. our, inner, our inner space of dreams, we don't really know sure its primary function, you know, um, or sleep. You know, there are many mm -hmm. chemicals that are going on in the brain and neurotransmitters during sleep and during REM sleep, but nobody knows if this is the reason we dream or just a byproduct. There was a very uh, popular, in the scientific community, a popular theory of dreams that came out in the, it was the late 70s, I believe it was, by uh, a guy named Alan Hobson at Harvard. And his theory was called the activation and synthesis theory. And what this means is, this theory came out at a time when there was a lot of work on dreams being like a, a form of therapy of the brain, right? Mm -hmm. it, it had a function, had purpose. What you dreamt revealed stuff about your personality, right? Or your fears or your phobias or your, uh, your regrets or whatever was part of your personality, like Freud wrote about right. or right. Jung wrote about. But Hobson, uh, and he did research on parts of the brain, uh, what they call uh, PGO waves in the brain. And basically his theory goes like the lower brain through evolutionary purposes, whatever, every once in a while during sleep, you know, four times a night, for example, what we call REM period, right? The, the brain stem just fires randomly into the, the cortex, the higher brain. 
just random, no, no reason at all. Bang, 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 bang. You're just mm-hmm. random firing like like having fun, you know? And no reason. So we don't even know why that even happens. No, no reason. They don't even know why. But what happens for the story, oh. because we all have these narratives, right, in dreams. We have these stories. So the higher brain is being bombarded by stimulus from the brainstem impulses. And it activates, that's the activation part of this theory. It activates various memories random memories from your childhood or maybe from a week ago or what you had for dinner, just random memories. And the the brain is built to give meaning to stuff. That's how we survive in our waking life, right? Mm -hmm. We we can't deal with chaos. We have to rationalize things. We rationalize. So the brain has got all these random memories, impulses going on from the brainstem. And it says it has to make a story out of it. So it says, okay, I'm getting, I'm getting the emery, a memory of a rake and I'm getting a memory of a of a Rolling Stone song and I got a little memory of a, oh. of a tomato, bacon tomato sandwich. How can I make a story out of this junk? <laughs> so it says, okay, I'm a story. I was working my yard. My brother called me in. He says he's got a bacon tomato sandwich and the radio was playing the Rolling Stones. There's my story. <laughs> so <laughs> is that one of the reasons why we, or if you can answer this, maybe why we just end up somewhere in our dream. You don't know how you got there or why or or anything. Is it because of all those random impulses that throw everything together and is trying to create a story that we're just like, oh, I'm in the middle of a field near a lake. Why, how, I don't know, but I'm there. Well, this theory would say that's true it, <laughs> because of that. You're just trying to, you're like a playwright that's given bad material and you got to make something out of it, right? And, and mm-hmm. so that's partly true. You know, remember the movie Inception? Mm-hmm. He trains yes. he trains the dream architect when they're sitting at the cafe to say, How did we get here? Because she thought it was real. Yeah. And and then when she couldn't answer that, they knew they were dreaming, right? Mm-hmm. So it's just like you said. But another strong theory of dreams is the opposite. Mm-hmm. That the function of dreams is the opposite of, of, of memory consolidation, what I was talking about earlier. Okay. And this theory was by Francis Crick. He was the co-discoverer of DNA. When Watson, so he was a pretty well named, respected guy, mm-hmm. and he was at San Diego at the time in the '60s. And his theory was that dreams are not to consolidate memories or give any therapy for your uh, for your personality or whatever. The function of dreams is to get rid of garbage memory. It's cleaning house. Oh. It's like let's mm. get all this trash out of this brain. Okay, we're cleaning this. We're doing some housekeeping on this brain. Who needs some of these old memories of something that happened in somebody's house 10 years ago or whatever, something on the wall. So let's throw them all out. So the dream is actually psyching through old memories and throwing out the trash. You know, whether it's orga- organic or recyclable, I don't know, but it's just cleaning the house. And that was his theory. And it sort of was sort of popular in scientific circles for maybe a few months. And then that sort of went away. And and then newer theories are like what they call uh, predictive modeling. The brain in dreams is trying to sort of predict the future because, you know, in uh, an early, from a biological sense, early man, you know, 50,000, 500,000 years ago, whatever, was living, living a sort of uh, precarious existence in the world, right? And uh, so if he could sort of run through his memories and try to, okay, given all my memories and what I've learned in this dream, I'm going to predict what's going to happen tomorrow, right? Am I going to be attacked by a lion or or another culture, another society? Uh, So it's a form of predictive modeling and and threat simulation. It's a lot of dreams are very negative, right? Yeah. Extremely negative. But I mean, as far as like it, thinking it's going to predict something. I don't think I'm going to turn into a superhero just because I came out of the bathtub wet. (laughs) Um, As cool as that would be, I'd be all for it. But like, I have a hard time with the prediction part of it. I like the brain dumping, kind of like what Dawn was saying, like getting rid of stuff. But I also like the the theory of keeping memories more for long-term and like a long-term memory uh, like database sort of a, a situation. I don't know. I mean, I'm not a scientist in that field, so I don't know. But how, what made you want to continue studying dreams, even though like, you know, that it, it's not very well studied at um, 
it's not in the forefront of of science that that we know it like you know space or source something mm -hmm. like that uh, and you know that the funding isn't really there so what is that combination that drives you that that's the science that the reason that you love it well i just for one they've always felt like magic to me you know a form of magic in the world because the world is sort of daily life gets sort of flattened you know because uh, our normal experience is is geared towards um uh, personal security and you know breadwinning and so forth and so dreams sort of free you up and they take you to all kinds of places and it's almost like a form of magic and uh like I said, when I was little, I was fascinated with dreams. Mm -hmm. at, at the age, that the, the, the French psychologist, uh, Jean Piaget, talked about the age when a child's first start realizing that the dreams he had last night are not real, that they're in his head. Instead of going to his parents and saying, you know, mommy, this tiger was chasing me last night. There's a point yeah, where he realizes. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. There's a point he realizes the tiger's just in his head. He doesn't have to be afraid, right? And so that's a key point in, in development of child, that, that reality versus the dream world. And uh -huh. the brain has to sort of accommodate that, right? And the, the dream world, anything can happen. Then when you wake up, you're expected to follow certain rules, right? Mm -hmm. and certain laws of physics and society. So yeah. ever since that I've been interested in, and I'm also, I actually work uh, for the state of California, mm -hmm. mental health now mental health department so i have a very strong interest in mental health and i feel that dreams have a part to play in the health of uh mm -hmm. of minds and so although, gonna ask. although you don't see that much of it in in the therapists what we call providers mm -hmm. in the state uh you don't see a lot of dreams being part of the, uh, some people some therapists they are but it's not widespread it's not oh. like uh, it's not like uh, uh cognitive behavioral therapy which is very popular now mm -hmm. but you don't see dreams too much but i'm still very interested in that dreams someday may especially if we can record them and uh we can sit down with a, a therapist in front of the computer screen and we'll watch our own dream that we had and talk about it right uh, <laughs> well hypothetically saying if you, if you had to like put like a date on when we would be able to put our dreams on a computer and hit play what Theoretically, when do you think that would happen? Hypothetically, <laughs> well, in in the in the in the sleep lab, probably five years. In the, in the in the home, probably fifteen or twenty years. I'm thinking because the big really? problem the big problem is not the software, as okay. you say, AI. The bigger problem is the hardware. Right now, most dreams, at least the visual aspect, are recorded in MRI machines, right? Like they use for scanning in hospitals. You've probably seen those, and. You, everybody wouldn't want to have one of those in their bedroom. First of all, oh. it would cost you a million dollars and and it wouldn't be that comfortable, but you can sleep in them. So, and now there's more and more though, that tech is becoming more portable, you know, smaller, more affordable. And mm -hmm. there's another tech called infrared, uh, which is a type of, uh, of, uh, of a brain imagery mm -hmm. and uh, imaging machine. And that's becoming more portable. You can wear that in your head and stuff. But you need the tech to be come down so something you can sleep with. Mm -hmm. right? it, 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 it's not six feet long machine that you get inside of, you know, or or it, it is comfortable and affordable so everybody could do it, not just people who could afford it. Yeah. And so you need the the hardware to become more poor. It's getting there. It eventually probably will get there. But that's that's the slow. So as, Go ahead. As you mentioned, you know, even mental health studies. You would think there certainly would be funding that would cross over and try to establish some commonality patterns within people that are mentally disabled. And if somehow even their sleep patterns, even their dream, you know, situations may have some causal effect. Uh, have you been involved in any of that research or are you aware of such research? Yeah, I, I am aware of some of the research. And I do think that things are moving more in that direction that you're talking good, about. Good, good. Yeah, and I think dreams are becoming more recognized as a big part of our life. I mean, if, if you just dreamt nonstop, you know, equivalent lifetime, and took all the times you've dreamt in your life, it would be like, and you just and you had that one long dream instead of scattered throughout your life, it'd be like six years of your life. Six years of your life. And people are 
more and more realize that that's a big part of life. Mm -hmm. This time spent dreaming six years. And so there's more and more, I think, uh, credibility uh, given to dreams. And so I think we'll see more of that and probably more funding. But, you know, without a, without a, a strong consensus on the theory of why we dream, the function of dreaming, it, it's tough to get uh, the big players, the big donors behind you, right? Uh -huh. because, I mean, like you talk about outer space. We have a good theory on how rockets rockets work, right? And we have a good theory on computers and how they work. We just don't have that great uh, of a theory on how actually how their actual brain works or how sleep or dreams work. And so that inhibits well, the progress. And, and sadly, I'm, I'm I, I honestly I'm wondering out loud if even the pharmaceutical companies may have something to do with the fact that that, that the more they can prescribe medications for people with sleep disorders, that uh, the, the subject of dreams then never comes up. The idea that if you have people that are habitually on uppers or barbiturates, as opposed to people that, you know, with, with, with downers to sleep, that type of thing. I may have mixed the two. I, I don't, I, I apologize for that. But the idea that where are these studies? The idea that, uh, again, people that are addicted to drugs, how are they able to even sleep normally as the rest of us do? Well, that craving is all there. Yes, that's right. And uh, I, I do have my own addiction, and it's uh, cigars. I smoke cigars. My and, father did, too. And my father I, did, too. <laughs> when I go without him for a while, I'll dream of smoking cigars. <laughs> I've, I've, I've had the best Cuban cigars in my dreams. I'll never be able to find them in real life. But and you smell time, them in your dreams, I guess. Uh, you know, I... I I don't remember, but you're probably right. You can, you do have smells in dreams. You can smell stuff. Wow. So, okay. Okay. That would be, oh, that would be extremely fat that you could actually smell as far as things that, and especially a good cigar. My father smoked a good cigar. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, good. Well, I, uh, I, I can relate to that. But, it, you know, if we talk about the, uh, the value of dreams and how society values them, yeah, it's interesting that in the first part of the century, Psychiatrists, right? MD psychiatrists were very big into psychoanalysis, right? The, like the Freudian, mm -hmm. which involved quite a bit uh, dreams. I mean, uh, you know, movies, a lot of movies at the time and stuff like that. Uh, Spellbound and stuff like that with the Hitchcock movie with about dreams. Right, and right. So the psychiatrists, it was an important part of their therapy. And then in the like the 70s and 80s, and even starting in the 60s, the, the movement of psychiatry away from the psychoanalytic towards the biological and towards the chemistry, you know, uh, prescribing drugs for depression or bipolar, the psychiatry profession tended, not all of them, of course, moving towards more of the biological model, the mm -hmm. physiological model, and away from the psychological or psychoanalysis model. And so along with that, the public sort of perception when you talk about medicine you think in terms of like prescriptions right you don't think in terms of dream therapy anymore no no, no. but i think you know uh things are moving that moving that direction you know i was just listening to an interview with before this in, with the interview with you folks elon musk right and uh oh. two-hour interview and i remembered that elon musk uh, i had been read that he like canceled one of his space launches of SpaceX because he had a bad dream about it. Dreams were very important to him, like as a child. He had many, many nightmares. He suffered from you know, recurrent nightmares. Huh. And I think interesting sure that so maybe we can tap him a little bit in the dream research. <laughs> well, but but interesting that you mentioned that and even the Bible. I mean, when you think as far as in the New Testament. The wife of Pontius Pilate during the trial of, of, of Christ, and that she had a bad dream about the situation. And that she was warning her husband, do not condemn this man. That she had, you know, that, that form of premonition. 
And so we're, we're, we're talking again, things that may have altered the course of history, aren't we, Daniel? <laughs> That's a good point. Yes. <laughs> and, and at the time in history, uh, dreams are considered very prophetic, right? The Egyptians, uh -huh. the Greeks, they had prophets, oracles, and dreams were, even in Native American history, I've been on the West Coast in the Pacific uh, Northwest, dreams were a big part of, of uh, prophecy. Yeah, and, huge. And making decisions about the, the, the group or the tribe were often based on what the tribal leaders dreamt, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was a huge uh, part of life. But I always found it interesting, you referred to like the biblical, is that much of like, uh, for example, in the Bible, an angel appeared in a dream or something, right? Mm -hmm. You see that a lot. Right, right. But then as the centuries moved on, I was always curious, why didn't this direct connection with God that, uh, the, you know, the prophets or the apostles or whatever uh, have written about, how come that didn't continue it, those dreams throughout the Middle Ages? And why wasn't that emphasized by the church? And Maybe it just I, wasn't recorded properly, unfortunately. No, I had actually read, and I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to commit myself to, to, uh, <laughs> to knowing for sure about this, but that the church, in this case, the Catholic church, at least, started teaching that once that once the savior came into the world he was our communication with god right and in many ways I, I have that thing. he was our communication we don't need dreams direct communication with god through dreams anymore because we have our communication now and you know i'm i'm uh, i'm i have that face so i uh i can see that discussion but it, it sort of put dreams behind a, a couple thousand years as far as you know being part of life mm -hmm. you know, being part of spiritual life and uh, uh some of that is coming back i think with different groups but well, uh, it's interesting to me it's interesting the part that dreams have played uh in cultures throughout history about and, and, and... go ahead go ahead Don. that's <laughs> okay no okay. i just want to uh, in considering on on the, uh, the the biblical theme uh and i think especially um, like during the Middle Ages, and then even as far as through the the whole heresy uh, situation with the church, that um, it's my impression that that dreams were even perceived as crossing that line where that if you open that door, you don't know if it's the the dark side or the good side. Mm -hmm. And so, in many respects, the church has labeled it with somewhat of a bad stigma, a bad reputation. Am I correct? Yeah, dream, uh, demons, for example, come into dreams. That's mm -hmm. how they get a hold of people. Mm -hmm. right? Incubus, succubus, stuff like that. They come in through dreams. That's how they get our souls. And mm -hmm. so, right, it was very much, uh, it was very much um, prohibited in a sense. But you know, if you think about dreams, in many ways, and Freud was probably right about this. The id is very active. We do some stuff in dreams. We may not want our neighbors to know, right? And <laughs> anything can go. Right. And so I could see where like the religious leaders say, you know, just try not to think about that stuff because you're going to do yeah. some stuff that you're going to really need to go to confession about if you dream. Right? <laughs> and actually, as far as recording dreams, one of the uh, one of the uh, negative aspects of recording dreams is dream hacking. If you can record your own dream digitally, Somebody can hack your dream and spread it out on the internet, right? You want everybody. Uh, yeah, to true. <laughs> you want everybody to see it. That's one thing. And mm -hmm. also, the other thing is that certain governments could passively restrain you. You have to go to sleep sooner or later, right? They can record your dreams, and they can find intelligence, like interrogations, what you're dreaming. If you're oh, dreaming, that's scary. Yeah, and if you're dreaming some illegal or perverse thing that they think... Incriminating it, evidence, right. Uh -huh. Right, right. It, it's sort of like that movie Minority wow. Report with Tom Cruise. Yeah. Right? yeah. It arrests yes. people yeah. for having certain thoughts. In this case... You were it, thinking about conspiracy, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, how, how vivid of, um, I guess images uh, do you get when you are tracking somebody's dream that's allowing you to to map that what does well, that look like there's sort of i haven't i haven't been involved with the visual recording but the, some of the other groups in the world in, in japan especially 
Uh, and the images are uh, somewhat fuzzy, definitely recognizable. Like if it's a horse, you can know it's a horse, right? You're dreaming about it. But it's sort of a fuzzy horse, you know? Yeah. But there was, uh, so it's coming along. You know, the imagery is coming more and more. And AI may help with that. But it would still be a fuzzy movie. It'd be like a, a 1920s talkie or 1930s talkie. It would be, at least at first. But there was a, on this topic, there was a movie in the in the 90s. It was called uh, Toward the End of the World. It was a, a German director named of, uh, Wenders. Wim Wenders. He, he wrote, uh, he did, produced the movie Paris, Texas, which won the Academy Award. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So anyway, um, Toward the End of the World was mostly a, sort of this road story, but a big part of it was one of the characters in the dream invented a dream recording device. And then you could play it back on laptops. Now keep in mind, this is like 20 years before laptops were even, you know, came about, mm-hmm. even invented 10, 15 years before that. So he was very pressing at even thinking about re- watching your dream on a laptop. But anyway, the point about it is people could replay their dreams on a laptop. They're pretty fuzzy, you know, pretty vague and fuzzy, but you could sort of see what was going on. The people who dreams were recorded they became addicted to their own dreams. They sit there all day on what with this laptop. No, oh, <laughs> excuse me, not a laptop, iPad. That's what they were, a tablet, yeah, yeah. Right, a tablet, not, not a lot. And so on these tablets, and that's all they wanted to do is watch their dreams over and over. They stopped eating, stopped sleeping, actually stopped almost doing anything except watching these dreams over and over and over. And William Hurt was in the movie. It was a good movie. Uh, and uh, they had to break that hat. It was like an addiction. And so who knows? That could mm. be an addiction if we could see our own dreams. Wow. Kind of like Avatar, but for watching your dreams instead of being an animal. <gasps> yeah, exactly. So is there one particular area of the brain that you would focus on, that you would stimulate to uh, you know, enhance these dreams or uh, there too, is this unexplored territory that there's no, I mean, you, you mentioned the cerebral cortex as far as that it, it fires, that it, it would shoot, you know, these sparks that uh, would generate, you know, certain responses within the brain. But uh, I know there's been research specifically with the frontal lobe of the brain. I'm talking about the late Dr. Michael Persinger up in Canada, and they would use uh, like quartz, uh, and luminous displays that would create hallucinations and interestingly enough they would all hallucinate being abducted by aliens which i find interesting yeah. and that they all hallucinate the very same thing but uh, so that type of research i know has had funding in the past so is there um is there a crossover and as far as is there any one region of the brain that uh seems to be more um, responsive. Well, to, there uh, is, there's different regions of the brain are active in different what they call modalities of the dream, whether it's verbal, you know, auditory, visual. So the different, all the regions are involved. But there is a, getting funding depends if you can find a product that you can sell, right? That people will buy, and mm-hmm. and sometimes they do influence dreams. There are a lot of apps that will help signal you to remind you that you're dreaming, so you can have a lucid dream or play certain music or sounds like the ocean of forest that come into your dream and affect your dream. And there's a new app that just recently was funded, a a couple million dollars, I think they got. I think it's called the Halo. And it's going to use ultrasound, a device that you wear on your head that goes into your, I'm not sure what, I think it's the thalamus part of the brain, or some part Mm -hmm. of the brain, um, the midbrain. And it's going to be able to influence your dreams or make you lucid in a dream or change your thinking pattern in a dream. I have no idea how it works, but I was reading about that. They did get funding. Uh, And this other gentleman that was over in Russia uh, working on dream speech and also uh, different types of lucid dream uh, experiment has a startup now in the Bay Area. He's going to be coming over here. He's probably glad Ah. He's probably glad he's uh, moving over here from uh, 
from where he was. Because, uh, because you're in California as well. So then you hopefully will be able to work together. That'd be wonderful. Yeah. I, you know, I, I sometimes um, feel that I'm not sure how much I can contribute anymore. Uh, you know, it, the, these young, these young guys coming out of the university are just so smart and uh, they have a lot of motivation. So, you know, I think, uh, I'm fine. I probably will be involved a little bit in some research, but probably not to the degree I was. And I'm also currently working with the state mental health. So I do have a, a growing interest, not only in mental health, but in homelessness and, and mm. some of the issues uh, facing the homeless and mental health is certainly one of them. Mm. Along with the substance. I would think the mental health angle would be something not only more timely more urgent than ever uh just dealing with all the mass shooters for example i mean is there some connection is there something going on we know there is but that this would be a, a natural transition that there's something that is happening in their lives and it may indeed involve something within their dream state and i think that's certainly something that needs to be explored i i know you would agree well, I do. I do agree. Uh, I'm not really sure how uh, it's tough to even somebody like like that. It's tough to get a cooperation. Right. And that's part of the part of the issue. I'm sure if you look, you could record some of those folks dreams. You'd see some pretty crazy stuff. Right. And I think a lot of the feelings they have or anger that they have or or those uh, forces that uh, end up uh, pushing them into behavior, you know, violent behavior or whatever. Those signs are pretty evident, but it, it's tough to get uh, cooperation. Even the state of California has struggled with this. How do you get people into sort of mental health if they don't want to? Yeah. What's, right. the so it's objective. Right. What's the line between their civil liberty, right? And mm -hmm. their own mental health, mm -hmm. which, which may be good for them, but if they don't want it, you know, uh, and good for society too. Uh, yeah. But where do you draw that line on, on liberty? And it's a tough one, you know. It's a scary thought, though. Like all, all, all in all together. And it, it could, there could be so much benefit that could be done if people were willing to, I guess, subject themselves to things that are more out of the ordinary, and and try something new or try something different. And I think that this, especially in the mental health area, if people were more willing to say, yes, I have a problem. I'll do this new thing. Um, instead of never admitting that they have an issue. And then, you know, it, it's, it's like you said, it's a forcible thing. You can't force anybody into it. And I just think it would benefit them so greatly to yeah. dive into that. And it's also important to, for people to realize that they, this is out there for them. And yeah. the, depending on your income, it's free. You know, yeah. the, the parity laws by the, the Centers for Medical Medicaid, what they call CMS, years ago required that parity with physical health and mental health, as far as funding and treatment, be the same. So just like seeing a doctor, you have a right to see a therapist. Mm -hmm. And in California, if you're below a certain income level, the state pays for all of it. So there's mm -hmm. people out there suffering, right? And whether dreams can play a part, I think they may be able to play a part in therapy. But there's people having issues that don't even realize that they can actually get this stuff, get some treatment with no cost to themselves. And so the state of California and the, and the federal government are both moving forward with more and more funding for different things. And I just hope that dreams in the future, uh, as they're understood more and more by the scientific community, and as those uniform theories that develop, We'll get more of the funding and be able to make people's lives a little better. So is that well, something so, that is uh, like one of your end goals would be to help the research or get the funding or, or what is your the biggest outcome that you would like to see or the biggest benefit that you would like to see from this? I think right now, it's just even something like this podcast, uh, to make public awareness that the need for this, the value of dreams, the importance of mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is probably my goal. I mean, I, a while back, right before the uh, pandemic, I had a group of about 50 scientists, right, at different universities lined up and some possible funding. And uh, 
we had a place for a laboratory. We're going to try to record a dream, bring all these people together, right, and record a dream. And then the pandemic came, and uh, and then other things went wrong. And by the time the pandemic was over, everybody sort of faded out, and the money sort of faded right. out. Uh, any, but anyway, anything. so I probably is not so much active. I may get a little active in the Bay Area with uh, with a couple of researchers and this one gentleman's coming over from Russia. Especially I mean, once the uh, the Russian scientist arrives in yeah. the area. So yeah, I hope to be uh, a, little, a little involved, but probably not a very centrally involved. If if I went to my doctor and I I didn't describe a physical ailment, but I said I'm very concerned that I'm having violent dreams night after night after night, that there's just no let up, that they're just very violent. Is that a precursor? Or is that almost a, a harbinger of something that that person would need to be watched? Well, your doctor would, have, I'm sure, prescribe you some medicine rather than do the old, old style psychoanalytic treatment because the right. approach usually is chemical nowadays, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, in years gone by, you, you would have tried to have therapy. Now, whether or not it's something to watch, uh, to be worried about, that uh, once again goes back to the theory. Uh, Freud says it's natural that, that in dreams, the id, our primitive animal nature, our aggressiveness, mm -hmm. right? Our fears, our aggression are, are all repressed during the day. And these come out in dreams, right? And we do wild, crazy Which, stuff. What we mentioned which we mentioned earlier, the idea that the brain goes crazy as far as, as uh, like a release, that pent up anger, that hostility throughout the day. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're sick because, you know, we, right. came, we right. came from lower level primates. And if you look at some, uh, some gorillas, they get pretty angry sometimes and, and other primates too. And so we came from this biological origin and Freud basically says we all have this animal instincts Aggression is one of them, violence, sex, hunger, all these primal drives. He says, it's nothing to be ashamed of that you dream this stuff, right? But the function of dreaming in the Freudian model is that the higher social brain, what he called the conscious, conscious, right? The superego, he called it, represses those primitive urges, and turns them into a story that's sort of acceptable so you don't think you're a bad person. So if you murder something in your dream, you stab somebody in a dream, the dream didn't do its job, Freud would say. It was supposed to disguise that. So you actually dreamt you were a soldier in a war protecting America, right? <laughs> and protecting your life. So that justified. Yeah. You kill yeah. somebody. Yes. Rationalized. So right. The story changes so you don't think you're a horrible person. Mm -hmm. And you have a nightmare when the story doesn't work. From the Freudian aspect, the story breaks down and you see sort of your primitive nature for what it really is, right? Which is not, it's in all of us, right? Mm -hmm. Biological nature. And so the goal of dreams is to disguise that stuff. So yeah. that makes it more acceptable to your conscience, your super ego, you know? So, uh, but that's Freud. <laughs> you know, then you got Carl Jung and all that's the right. universal uh, collective unconscious. So it's a huge area. The thing about like with for young people, there's many areas that are pretty much worn down in life. In other words, you can't go into them and make any big changes. Nobody is going to discover photosynthesis anymore, right? That's pretty mm -hmm. much been fi figured out. <laughs> Plus, huge amount of areas of science, but dreams are still really still new. Mm -hmm. People could go in yeah. right? It's inner space. Uh, but of course, the the student who says, "I'm fascinated by dreams," I get I get emails from from young people. I'm fascinated by dreams, but mm -hmm. they're looking for career advice. And I says, "Well, uh, I think I'm fascinated with dreams. I think it would be exciting to, for you to spend your life in studying dreams. But where are you going to get a job? <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. Who, who's hiring Stand the dream specialist? <laughs> right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Well, Daniel, we're getting down to the last little bit here, um, but before before we, Can I pose one 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 final question, though. Yes, of uh, course. Which we didn't, we didn't touch on. Uh, you did a paper as far as an actually using this research against terrorism, the idea that somehow that 
it would either be used on a potential terrorist or in, in uh, uh, identifying a potential terrorist. There again, the idea that are there things, the telltale things within their their dreams or their very behavior that well, this crosses the, into. Yeah, their dreams, if you could record a terrorist dream, you could get some hints of, of what might mm -hmm. They're planning or, or names or something to pop into their dreams, right? And you have to correlate that with other intelligence, but it would help you maybe uh, uh, solve uh, uh, certain terrorist plots or whatever, right? It, 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 as a form of interrogation, passive restraint, because right. they're right. intelligent. Although I did tell that to uh, two people, a retired Air Force general and a retired Air Force intelligence officer. The general thought it was great. Yeah, let's, let's, Let's tie them up and record their dreams. But the intelligence officer says, "Hey, if they knock on a, if they can knock on a terrorist door and record their dreams, they'll someday be coming to your bedroom and recording your dreams." Yep. <laughs> it's a scary yeah, thought. I mean, it could help us make, solve uh, murders and stuff yeah. like that. But mm -hmm. the flip side is, it could be done. I mean, to use the turn make... against us. Yeah. Super, super privacy mm -hmm. invasion, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. massively. Right. <laughs> well, Daniel, before we go, no, is there anything that you want to say to all of our listeners at all? Any advice or just any tidbit you'd like to give them? Oh, just um, keep dreaming and uh, um, sweet dreams. <laughs> <laughs> and and you have a website and uh, your your uh, Twitter account, whatever you have. Uh, any way that if people would like to contact you or. Uh, as far as uh, look well, out I'm, for your research and all your papers. Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn and I have on academia.edu, I have a page with all my research, academia, search for my name. Okay. And uh, and I keep, every once in a while I write new, I did one re uh, fairly recently on how you could use lucid dreaming or how people have used it to heal regret. People who suffer from really pathological regret over and over. What they, using lucid dreaming to help cure that or, or help to heal it. So anyway, I still do, I'm still working off and on, but um, uh, between myself. Well, we wish you well, because that, that sounds like yes. that could indeed be something that could, you know, actually provide some funding, especially if it yeah. has positive results. We wish you well. Well, thank you. Thank you. And, and thanks both of you for having me on and um, good luck in your future podcast. Thank you, Daniel. Well, everybody, that's it for this evening. Um, I really hope that you've enjoyed the episode. Please be sure to rate and review us. It helps other people find it so that they can listen to things that are completely unexplainable. If you'd like to find out what we're doing in the future, please find us on Facebook and Instagram at No Earthly Explanation. And if you'd like to follow Don, you can find him on Facebook at Donald Raymond Schmidt. And if you'd like to follow me, you can find me at Ellie Knows Rocks or Ellie Ringo. If you have any questions at all about this episode, please feel free to reach out to us. And if you have any thoughts or things that we could have for future investigations, please let us know. And you can find us and email us there at noearthlyexplanation at gmail.com. Metacortex Publishing hopes that you've enjoyed this presentation. Please take a moment to listen to some other podcast offerings from Metacortex Publishing. A quest is a search for something. And every week, the Quest podcast will show you how we know what we know through interviews with people that have incredible stories of dedication and perseverance. I'm your host, Todd Fisher. Join me in this thought-provoking and inspiring podcast of discovery. Find us anywhere you listen to podcasts. I'm Amber Rose, the Religious Hippie, and I host the podcast A Catholic's Perspective. Join me every two weeks as I release episodes targeted towards helping young Catholics navigate their ever-changing secular world while staying strong in their faith. Whether you are a Catholic or not, all are welcome here. So if this is something that interests you, feel free to tune in. You can find A Catholic's Perspective on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. I hope to see you there. Bye! Cult Following is a podcast that studies the personalities and common traits of cult leaders and their followers. 
Get the real story behind these infamous and oftentimes tragic cults from a new perspective through exhaustive research and from interviews with people that were there. Available anywhere you listen to podcasts. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please be sure to rate and review this episode. This podcast is produced by Todd Fisher and Anthony Smith and is distributed by Metacortex Publishing. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Information and opinions stated in this podcast should not be construed as medical advice. Please be sure to visit the official website for Metacortex Publishing at metacortexpublishing.com or find us on social media for other unique content.